Right. So Shivram uh, Krishnan recently joined us as a postdoctoral fellow. He was faculty member in Chennai, India, uh, erstwhile Madras. And uh, he's been there for a while looking into, into deep learning and really trying to discover where and how deep learning actually works in terms of recognizing the features of interest. This is a different global health problem. Uh, earlier of TB, this is malaria. Both came our way, happens since. But to build on this, I will uh, take the liberty of having you see a two minute video that where we built that will set the stage of the technical part of the talk that I will go into. So that should set the background as to what this work is all about. Uh, it is a real application. It is being used in our collaborators in, uh, in Thailand and Bangladesh, uh, who are also helping us acquire new image sets as we go along. Professor Richard Maud, who's not pictured here, but this is his facilities, uh, who is a part of this Moru Mahidol Oxford unit. Um, and that's our system in use in, uh, in Bangladesh, actually. Uh, uh, the picture shows Bangkok because uh, Dr. Silamut is in Bangkok, but is the uses in, in Bangladesh at the moment. Uh, just again as a big, brief background, there is an alternative to using microscopy. It's uh, RDTs, which we commonly ask this question in, when we present this talk. Uh, and the problem is, is, uh, it is uh, RDTs are species specific. So if you have falciparum, you'll have one set of RDT. If you have vivax, you'd have another, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, they are not quantitative. They just tell you if you have disease or not. And to do disease tracking to see if the drug is, is effective, you need to know how many cells were, were spotted that were still parasite bearing. And parasite staging is an important aspect as well. So you still need microscopy anyway. And therefore, you come back to the burden problem. And that's where we come in again. So uh, just as background, the images are uh, are gym sustained. They are falciparum in this case, but falciparum is. Uh, Parasite is most common in Bangladesh, uh, and we will expand to Vivax sometime. 
in the future, but at the moment we are still with thin smears. And even though we have a system in the field that's performing reasonably well, more in the 90s, we're trying to improve the way, uh, the mistakes it makes and uh, the way it counts, because all this is out, it's not the number of cells, but it is the parasitic load, which is mapped to the number of parasites per milliliter of blood, which maps to uh, how many they count, cells they count, uh, and the and the hematocrit factor and everything else. So there, the numbers that go into a WHO formula that are important. And so errors on one side, uh, the way humans count them, if you have a variable rate on humans, then they would count, over count up to 2,000 cells and then uh, reverse engineer the, the solutions to some standard that they, they are working on in that lab. But the people who are counting are, again, uh, people who are hired for the job, not necessarily experts in the field. And, and they do become expert over time, but that's, that's a problem. Uh, just a sampling show, to show what the segmented cells look like. They're neatly laid out in this, in this picture for just visual purposes. And usually the uh, parasite will acquire the stain and therefore uh, be visible. Uh, however, reality is much different. So we've got to compute the degree of parasitemia, like I said. Um, and uh, we have used SVMs uh, in the past. We have evaluated MLP and uh, decision trees, although SVM still holds out better. And uh, in the previous experiment, uh, we have, which we published, we got 27,000 cells that were, that, were, uh, that were analyzed. And the accuracy was pretty good. It was 97.3%, but not enough, because we don't know where the 3% error really is and why we are making those mistakes. So just to give a brief background for those who may not be familiar with deep learning, uh, basically, you have these local receptive fields in the convolutional neural network that uh, will feed into hidden layers, and then you have rectified linear units that will that will measure the activations. Again, it acts like a thresholding to to uh, to suggest which are the most uh, active contributors within the from the previous convolutional layer, and uh, then you do this at multiple different scales by by pooling uh, these results. And the end is, uh, uh, is this the diagram that is customarily required to, in any talk, giving deep learning as a thing. People show this, 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 uh, this uh, CNN diagram. The point I want to make again here is that is just refresh yourselves that you have these various layers. At each layer, you are uh, the, the RELU layers are the where you are making the decision that uh, of which, which Previous layers, convolutional units, uh, are most contributing, and where, what weights you're applying at this RLU layer that feeds forward into the next layer after pooling is where you are actively deciding uh, the contributions of uh, the, the, uh, the active decision layers. And that's important because you have the opportunity of tweaking those, uh, even though you may choose not to, and that is what is, is an accepted approach. If you want to condition and optimize your deep learner, you have to go back to that layer and then tweak and bias them appropriately. Uh, and that's where this talk comes into play, is uh, how you do that. And usually there are three ways of training a CNN model. You can train from scratch and build your own custom model, which is great because you essentially can get up multiple labels out of the CNN. The assumption is that you have vast amounts of data of every type to learn from. Uh, if you don't, you augment it and get around the problem. This is what we did uh, to come to the end of the talk first. Uh, but it is a way uh, you can, you have complete control over your leap learner at this point. Uh, the more popular approach is transfer learning, wherein you take existing models, AlexNet, VGG, uh, which is the inception model. Then there's the more recent exception model. Then there is ResNet and there are the many other models which are trained on 15 million or more uh, images from, mostly from ImageNet, uh, data, data. They have multiple categories. Uh, I, I believe they are in the order of 15,000 categories. Uh, and so there are enough samples per category, and it, it learns to label a car as a car, and a truck as a truck, and a tree as a tree. And, and it's exactly what's going on in Google search and other places. But if that's not your problem, if your problem domain is specific to malaria, in, in this case, you are, there are two things going on. You're working against learn knowledge to an extent and you are assuming that what you've, the feature will be that a car will carry forward into a malaria cell, which it does, but not entirely. Secondly, you lose the ability of tweaking your parameters because you, the way it works is you load 
the existing model, and the, it's the it's this it's this part of the stack that you are controlling. It's at this layer that you are adding your own images, the final class, the fully connected layer. Now that works forward. It builds on the model that the decision that arrived at that point from the previously loaded weights, and it will yes optimize the weights going backward one layer, but no more. That's what it does. You don't have the existing layer anyway. You only have the model to load. So if you cannot control those previous layers, you essentially have lost the decision that ability at that point, the flexibility, if you will. So given that limitation, uh, transfer learning is good and powerful, but but no, isn't so. And the, finally, the, the, the oh, by the way, feature, uh, they also use a, a conventional neural network to extract features uh, in a more of a uh, autoencoder style, if you will or for getting a, a two-class problem solved. So our goal was to, of course, improve a later classification, but also to understand the impact of various learned parameters along the way uh, and see how we, can, how we can improve the deep learning model performance. And for that, we want to visualize the extracted features and the network activations, uh, and also prove it that we actually are better than transfer learning as far as uh, the current models go. Now. The, on the left is this, this model. If you see the paper, you'll, you'll see the model described again. Uh, the 13 layers total in, in general, uh, with, with varying number of channels and, and, and activations. But the key point here, the, the takeaway here, is that you, we want to control the initial weights. Uh, and we use an existing algorithm that uses Gaussian weighting based on number of uh, neurons that are connected at any given layer. But uh, we also want to compare the performance pre-trained models with similar layouts uh, the best we can. Um, and two, two, uh, this is kind of repeating again what I just said, I, I've gone, gone around in slides. Uh, the idea of visualization is to generate the images at every layer. So it's not just the activations of every, every, uh, uh, every neuron, uh, neuron, every convolutional model, but also to, uh, to view the image as reconstructed at that layer and see if it highlights the, the areas of interest uh, compared to the original. So this is an example of, of uh, various channels, various images at a given channel. And uh, the one in the middle is the original image, highly scaled up and therefore blocky. And the activation uh, is seen in this case, uh, deliberately so. Uh, and the point is that it also, have, uh, it also shows you the areas of non-activation, which is gray. Uh, black is negative activation, which is nice. So here are some more images. Uh, first layer basically picks up colors and edges, kind of blindly, doesn't do much anything fancy. Second layer happens to be color and texture. Uh, if you look at the chest x-ray uh, version of this, it is not so uh, explicit because there is no color to begin with. So it's different kinds of textures picked up in that example. Uh, the third layer onwards, the layers, are, they are complex features. We really don't understand what's going on because we don't we lose association with, with the reality at that point. And the only way we would, we would do is to visualize the reconstructed image at that, uh, we stop the deep learner at that layer reconstruct the image and compare what, what the activation is. And that's the only way you would know at what point it is good. And so, uh, like I said before, strong positive activations are represented by white pixels and negative act activations are black pixels and you can threshold and pick what you're interested in. So we're only picking the positive activations because of the uh, presence of, uh, of nonlinearity in the, in the uh, rectif rectified linear units in the, in the, in the remaining layers. So, uh, here's an example of uh, the third unit with the 40th channel. And how is this done? Not automatically. We actually manually visualized every one of these to find out what the what pathway was good. Co incidentally, um, I was I was happy to learn. I was talking to some Google engineers just because we happen to know some of them. And this designing of your own network is a very common practice. I mean, it was new to us, and maybe we came to the game rather late. But essentially, the network doesn't have to look like a nice little cone that ends in, into this class. It can look like a skewed shape also, as they explicitly ground certain, if you want to use an electronics engineering term, they, may, they, they drive to zero certain channel outputs because they don't care about them. They know that these channel outputs will not lead to the, uh, to the decision that they want to arrive at, so that their network may not look like what you think as an idealized network published in most in the slide here previously and most exemplars. That's an, that's an idealized network. 
So you can shape your network as you, as you see fit based on the application that you might have. In fact, you'll arrive at better results than using an off-the-shelf freebie network which will give you real condition to the best thing it was trained on. So if you're, if you're yourself designing your own networks, be very aware of what your end goals are and then work backwards to see the, how you can control your own networks. Uh, so this is a, these are these are the uh, activation of the 40th channel, and the, and uh, uh, this picture doesn't have what I want to, a message I want to convey. I, I think it comes up ahead. Uh, so in transfer learning, it can be used. In this case, we use AlexNet, VGGNet, uh, and VGGNet 16 and 19. There are two kinds. Uh, one uses a three by three size filter, and the other one uses uh, a 19 layer weighted uh, uh, filter. And what the, the VGG uh, networks revealed was that you can essentially mimic a multi-scale uh, network by using two smaller scale networks. So they, they use a 3x3 three three and a 5x5 five five convolution layer, uh, convolution masks, instead of using a very big convolution mask. And they're able to scale to 7x7 seven seven and 9x9 nine nine because of using these by doing mathematical functions. So these are very powerful networks in, the, in what they do because they give you a multi-scale response doesn't, uh, and it worked well for us as well. It's not a bad network by any means. I'm not saying they're bad. It's just that we were compared against these. these. And there are others There's, you, can, you can find in the open source literature that you can uh, download and use. Uh, this I already said basically that the last one, you only have control over the last block where you can, where you can uh, fine tune your, your weights and they trickle back just one layer. Um, uh, if you're using the Keras wrapper, uh, which is the wrapper for VGG, um, you essentially it will use what is known as a stochastic gradient descent algorithm, which I cannot tell you more about right now because I myself have not fully studied it, but Shivram is the, the expert in our lab for that. Uh, but what it does is it, it, it will gradually optimize the, the weights of the last decision layer for the pretend model. Uh, and and we would use that. But coming to nice graphs, uh, what you see essentially in the number, as the number of samples increase, the validation accuracy for the customized model, which is in blue, uh, is consistently better than the pre-trained AlexNet model, which is in orange, and the uh, pre-trained VGG16 model, which is in gray in between. So no matter what, uh, even as number of samples, so we have now 55,000 or and change uh, cell samples. And as we go on increasing the number of samples, uh, the model, the customized model always does better. The cost of it doing better, of course, was that we had to spend time tweaking the weights in, in, in the training phase. Uh, and so if it doesn't matter to your application, don't worry about it. This entire talk is useless. It, you, don't, you don't need to worry about it. If it does matter that you would like to, you would like to decide why you, wh what the decision is, and, and I want to drive from 97.3 to 99 because I'm going to lose one patient well, then you might want to worry about this a little bit. So that's that. Uh, we also see uh, in, in, uh, in, in number of samples for sensitivity, uh, we are, as, as we added uh, in steps of 5,000, yes, you see this interesting wave-like uh, patterns. I was very curious what happened there. And essentially, it's because we have not added enough samples. When we added a bunch of samples, it improved, but it also, uh, it also lost out uh, in, at times when it didn't have uh, the, uh, so for every time we added a wave, you were using improvement in sensitivities. While in specificity, it's, it's less of a wave, but, but it's, it, again, it, other than these two playing a, a game of crossing over, consistently we are seeing the advantage of having a customized model over a pre-trained model. So now this model is what we're going to try and roll out onto the phone, which is a harder problem. Uh, you, somebody asked me about uh, resources for a laptop this morning. That is an easier one to solve than having this rolling, rolling this out on the phone. But it's uh, with the modern Samsung, especially, I'm not, this has not been done on an iPhone yet. Uh, we are doing S6s, I think. Uh, uh, for that, in minutes, it does it. So it's, it's, not, it's not an impossible task. The greater problem turns out for, I think, is actually placing that thing on the, placing the phone on the microscope and so that it images the entire field correctly. 
in terms of uh, computation time, uh, as number of samples go up, the time goes up. That's, that's, but this is just, it doesn't apply because you'll eventually be looking only at one sample. So some of this math doesn't apply. But this is just, uh, this is uh, over, over training uh, and testing phase. So here is another example image where you, we have images from each, uh, each model. So you have the original image and the custom model at layer three was able to find uh, the location of the parasite more precisely with a narrower error uh, and than others. Uh, VGG 16 and VGG 19, which are uh, at the, the final layers, were able to, to find it as well, uh, except for this little problem here uh, and uh, similar ones in other images. Uh, AlexNet in general had a had interesting misses going on here, and also had uh, had a false positive at the bottom there. So, in, just by visual comparison, it's subjective. But the idea is that it. Uh, even numbers reveal better performance. You start looking in behind, under the hood as so to what's really going on. This is where you start seeing that you, you should be picking one over another if you're making a selection across these various uh, phase models. So you may not, not want to spend the time. You could, you, you could, looking back and rewinding time, you'll say, well, I see you spend a lot of effort building your custom model. VG19 is not bad. I'm happy with that. And that's fine. I'm not saying that ours is the best model. It's just saying that when you, when you lift up the covers and look under the hood, you start seeing where the deep learner is behaving the way it is and how you could, you could affect its change if you had to. So in conclusion, did we improve? Uh, yes, we did. We've gotten, uh, gotten better numbers uh, for, for, for malaria. And more importantly, we, were, we learned the fact that visualizing features and activations is important if you're building uh, applications. And optimizing parameters uh, leads to a superior and more importantly an efficient model. So because the deep learning model is, is, has the baggage of the, all the images it has seen that may not be important for a problem, you will go through those steps and eventually arrive at what you got. But why do the extra? So in terms of time, we are also uh, much, much better performing time than others. That's the takeaway. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So you said the customer's model is straight from scratch, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's from scratch. Completely scratch. So custom, which is custom. So going back to, in fact, uh, here, where you go. Where I see, it, it is, I had the images. And I said, well, these are the positive images, these are the negative images. So you using Correct. And so we split our set into two parts, and uh, actually three parts. The, two, the testing part is two parts, and then you have the training part. And the advantage of a malarial cell is I can create more data just by rotating it four times. It's a cell. Uh, so I get away where by, I create more data from the same one. So it, it has seen the same kind of images, because the only variation really in the cell is where is the parasite. The, the variety remains fairly narrow. It is either a round dot or it's a bob. So the location is what, if you're looking at just the cell. I've ignored in this talk all the extra work that we did in cell segmentation and everything else. That is, and that was in the, in the video in the beginning. And that's separate. It's all been done. Uh, this is post the fact that, you, and there are problems there too, where we have clumped cells and it doesn't, cannot know, it gives the figure eight as output, which is not that. So there's a lot of engineering that's, that's there, but I'm ignoring that for this talk. Assuming now you have the finely segmented, mostly finely segmented cells, then you can uh, build your own model. And going back to the graphs that you were, so you had a question there, was so in the customer model, right, you your own right, so correct, exactly. So why is why did we end up with this network? Isn't magical that we have this 13 layer network and with these numbers uh, is actually where the work is. And so, so, you, so if you, if you, if you, yeah, exactly. So if you're custom, it's, it's a repetitive rinse repeat process. You can start with a, like for example, if you were to start today, you could start with this model and say, you know what, this gave me this, I'm gonna start tweaking it. But, so there are places you can start off with and then modify. Certainly, nobody has to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. But 
uh, it is built for this application. Uh, and that's the that's in fact that's that's the take home. That if you're building something, start with you will probably end up with a more efficient network, and a better performing one than a uh, transfer learning one. Uh, that said, if your if your problem is to do a web retrieval engine, please go transfer learning because you just learned way more than what you can. Uh, I mean, this we have a binary problem. That's why. They will. They will. So that, that is that's a good that's a good question for which I don't have an answer in the sense that it has even been shown f as far back as 2013. Uh, Hyde Greenspan gave this talk at SPI Med Imaging, uh, where she was she just took 600 test X-rays, and that version of AlexNet from 2013, uh, and she just threw it in there and was doing something similar without doing visualization. She was seeing at what layer, and uh, it essentially gave a very good result. It was in the 90s. But uh, she had to pick the layer. So at layer 4, it was bad. Layer 5 was great. Layer 6 was bad again. So she said that I happen to know the truth. And, and so that time, the deep learning was just coming around. And she said that the problem, one of the problems we have, which we still have today, is we don't know at what point it, it figures out <coughs> that it, has, uh, it knows. And again, the question really is, is, what has it figured out? If you're just looking for labels, that's one question. If you're looking for greater intelligence in that thing, I think you should be asking a different question for a different network. So uh, if your problem is annotation and classification of this is a microphone, that's a laptop, that's a human being, it's, a, it's one thing. If you're trying what did his speech pattern, what are the semantics behind the scenes, uh, you're looking for a deeper, deeper layer at that point. And that's where, in fact, Siri and uh, all others are at, because they're trying to get into semantics. And that may be a separate network altogether. So you, you'll be careful of what question you're asking and what kind of, how is the answer being presented? That's key. So again, in continuation of the same sure. question, uh, for building a customized model, uh, what kind of challenges that you handle? Because I'm thinking from the project time. that I'm doing. Time, time. It is not, it is, it is months. There were four or five months to come to this level. Uh, but so, so because you, you it's, it's a visual effort, right? it's a manual effort. You got to see, and you got to visualize. Now, computational resources were available to us. We got very lucky. We got machines with GPUs on them, and we got access to three or four. And so, processing was generally still days. But it was, it's if you have access to fancy resources, you'd be much better off. So there, but there's still the element of converting the images back, sampling the right number of images, and seeing that you where the tweaks are necessary in making the correct changes. There's a lot of ifs along the way in this. So that is a, a but once, so to give you, but there is good, there's good news at the end. Going from he, this model into visualizing for chest x-rays was a matter of weeks, less than a month in fact. So uh, adapting it to a different two-class problem becomes a lot easier because it's a still two-class problem. Uh, which is why transfer learning works. To, to kind of give you a loosey washy answer is why does it work when you have learned so much? It, because it's seen so much of it. Uh, but it worked across two cloud. It worked from cells to chest X-rays without much problem. We are in the you saw you began seeing localizations, which is essentially the same thing you're seeing here, uh, without with very little work. We had to do some resizing and the manipulations, but mostly it was just that. Good, positive degrees are equal. So we have 125,000 each, positive negatives. So there's 250,000 total. Uh, 55,000 are, are the test. The rest were for training and, verifi and, ver and verification. So it was, was, was split into 70, 30, I think, uh, or 60, 40, something like that. So we are given separate, but we have to do, our total collection is 250,000 cells uh, of and, and the equal number. And the size of each, I think, is reduced to 44 by 44 pixels. Uh, they are not much larger anyway. Uh, the reduction is very small. It's probably 25% of the size. Yeah? So gone from infrastructure, what is 
Good question. Good. So I, I, that, that will have a more wishy-washy answer, but the first one is more easy to answer. So the researcher himself under his desk has a standard i7 desktop well, with, uh, with uh, two uh, NVIDIA GTIs, 1080 GTIs on, uh, with him. And that still takes a day and a half uh, or to, uh, less than two days to, to uh, compute. We have done the same thing on a multiprocessor server so we have we use a, a like pa the uh, parallelization toolbox under MATLAB, and it gives you four or five servers, and that that without GPUs will take about uh, you know, three to five days. So there's a significant so having GPUs is an advantage, no doubt. Uh, we are so it, this is just the two extreme examples. We use a mishmash of the two. The problem with using non GPUs is visualization becomes very hard because it's doing OpenGL, uh, soft OpenGL implementation. So your, your, the pictures are not necessarily accurate of what the GPU would see otherwise. So you, with GPU, you get a much better uh, pictures in, in, at various layers. So that's one part story. The question is, where does it mean in product? It is not a product. It's, we are a national library of medicine. We are a government agency. So we are building this as a research collaboration. So if, you, if there's a problem, so we've talked to people in Bangalore, India. We've talked to a group in Pakistan. We talked to a group in Mexico, uh, south of, of the US. All three of them want to try this out. Uh, they all have different workflows, it turns out. Uh, Pakistan is more concerned about avian spread malaria. So malaria is not some of the presence of mosquitoes. There are birds, migratory birds coming in who already infected malaria from elsewhere. And they are spreading among, the, uh, among themselves and therefore into the diet of the humans and, and, and such. So they, have, so they have a different class of problems. Uh, the people in, in Bangladesh have a seasonal problem because of uh, the, the monsoons. And Mexico does not even do thin smears. They only do thick smears. So I, I, all of this story was thin smears. Uh, thick smears, you end, end up seeing more white blood cells because they're not dis doing disease tracking. And we are working on that now. That's a much, lot harder to segment. You see a lot of gray with a light boundary. So all you can do, there is count number of white blood cells. Because that gives you the degree of body's reaction to infection. But doesn't tell you what class of disease it is, what kind of malaria you got, and what stage are the cells, that, the parasites themselves. Because if the parasites go through one more breeding cycle, it leads to mortality very quickly. And so all of that work requires thin smears, which is why we went thin smears first. So it's, a, it's more of a research product to give you a long-winded answer. Uh, but yeah. So when we talk to people in Bangalore, I kind of skipped over that. The comp there was a company, and uh, they couldn't see the monetary value uh, of individual cell. They are more interested in a machine that can process glass slides uh, in a batch that they can then you know, charge revenue for, which is all fair. But that's the problem there. We are in a research lab environment, not so much in a product development environment. But we do build things to prove a point, so there's that as well. So we, in fact, we chose not to. It was, it was in, our model was not informed at all by them in the sense that we didn't, since we're doing custom custom model, we started with some some description of a model and then we built on. It was not necessarily an AlexNet model per se. Uh, it may look similar eventually, but uh, it didn't begin that way. And, and of course, we're not using any transfer learning at all. This I mean, that's the whole point. But, uh, it, for us, it didn't give us the, uh, we got better output at lower memory consumption and faster time with a custom model than transfer learning. But outside of transfer learning, you also retrain the other applications? No, we haven't. And I'd like to have you talk to you about it then, uh, offline perhaps. Yeah, we went with the extreme, the two extreme approaches, the, the custom or transfer. You are suggesting there's something in between. You can teach me. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much.